Kia ora to all citizens of Aotearoa or potential citizens or all people who are just interested in what we are doing here in Aotearoa. I'm a citizen of Aotearoa by choice. Some of you have been born in New Zealand and that's why you're a citizen of New Zealand. Some of you have been born here and you want to be here, so you are a citizen both by choice and birth. And some of you are just complaining. Maybe you're from another country and you're complaining. I've got a solution for you. Please go back. We don't want to spread the negativity in this lovely green country. It's a privilege staying here. And every day that I wake up, I remind myself of that privilege. And I'm just grateful of being a citizen of this lovely country. When I came here, I had to learn a lot of things about New Zealand. One of the things was, I did not know whether we were a republic or not. Now, some people couldn't even tell me. And still today, if I ask people, what are the famous year in which we became a republic? They will think and think and don't know. And it is simply because we are not a republic. We are a monarchy. We are part of the Commonwealth. And... I don't think it will stay like that for forever, to be honest, but I don't want to go into that. The next question that I like to ask people is our constitution. Do you know our constitution or do we have a constitution? If people say we don't know because often people don't know whether we've got a constitution or not, then I ask them, where can you find it? And people don't know where to find our constitution. And the reason for that is, you know what? Some constitutions, if it's, it's one single written document, it's one single legal written document, and then it's in a codified, we say that it's in a codified form. But for us in New Zealand, our constitution basically evolved and it's still busy evolving. So you don't find our constitution. We've got an uncodified constitution. In other words, it's all this different sources, all this different sources of legal documents and conventions are all things, everything combined. And that forms our constitution. That's why we say we've got a history and not really a written constitution. There's a lot of advantages being like that because parliament can quickly act according to situations, new situations that might evolve and where if you've got a constitution, if you've got the um, rule of law, it's more difficult to just change it and but it's probably more sure and safer. Nevertheless, I don't want to go into that. I want to tell you about our history and just Think for yourself. Just imagine if you've been a person living there in the times of the ancient kings, people, all rule and all authority were in the king's hands. Often those kings became bad dictators. Remember what they said happened. If they didn't like you, Remember, he could just say, take this guy away, chop off his head. Because the king was like the law. 
in itself. The problem was that this was like kind of like a very subjective thing. Because if you get like an emotionally stable person, it's not a problem. But if you get somebody emotionally unstable, just think for yourself, a person like Robert Mugabe in Africa, how he destroyed Zimbabwe, or Idi Amin, who killed mother's children in, in their arms. He ate people, cannibalism. He did whatever he wanted to. And you often get that kind of dictatorship. So it's very risky to put too much power in the hands of a dictator or one person only. History. History. Luckily, what happened at one stage, if you've watched those Robin Hood movies, that guy that can shoot with an uh, arrow and bow like nobody else, if you watched those movies, that King, King John, he was, they reckon, the worst king that ever lived, the worst king in history. What he did, he basically, he's put his own wife in prison. He murdered his nephew. He did whatever he wanted to. He was out making war with different people. And in order for, his, for all this war events to take place, he needed money. And where did he get the money from? He simply taxed the people. So, okay, just think for yourself. He taxed the people. He heavily taxed them. And if they didn't want to pay this, those taxes, he got angry. And guess what he did? He took their property. So he basically did whatever he wanted to. And then the barons, the people that, he, that were supposed to help him, give him like advice, they stood up against him, 40 barons. And they basically took London over and eventually the king had to um, surrender, surrender his power. And he was forced into negotiations. And that's where the Magna Carta, the Great Charter came from, the most important document in our legal history ever. There's none other document that's been studied so widely and all other documents, our whole legal system can be taken back to the Magna Carta. It happened in 1215 in Runnymede where they forced him to sign the Magna Carta. And in it, basically for the first time in history, the powers to be an absolute dictator, to do just whatever he wants to, was taken away from the king. It's a wonderful thing that happened, even though the Magna Carta was an extremely good thing that happened, and it increased our freedom. People, it wasn't the... A total solution. Because what those kings did, they were clever. They realized, okay, we had to give people a fair trial. That was one of the things. And then they've just put him in jail and kept him there for an unlimited time. And when some of the servants will say, King, when are you going to listen to that person or when will he be brought in? Don't worry. No, no, I will give him a fair trial. But in his mind, 10 years later. So that was a position that people were still sitting in. And then, then the next important act that came out was the habeas corpus at subducendum. It's the Latin word for, you can only have the body for a short limited time to inquire and to make sure that you legally have like the right to basically keep this person in 
jail for a certain time until his trial will uh, come up. Even today, they cannot just keep you in jail. That you have the right to know why and as soon as possible, your trial must happen. In the time of Charles II, you could not, because he enacted the Test Act. And according to the Test Act, you could not obtain a public office, a high position in the government or the state, if you were like a Catholic. James II in 1685, when he became the king of England, he wanted to get rid of this act as soon as possible. And he tried it. But then it was his will against the parliament. And in other words, the, the rest of the representatives of the English people in parliament, they were against him. So what he did, he simply ignored them. And he appointed Catholics in high positions and the people were very unhappy about it. He wasn't a good king. He still followed his own mind. And luckily for the English people, they realized, okay, James II doesn't have sons. So his daughter Mary will succeed him. Unfortunately, then there was like a baby born a son and nobody expected that and they realized it's not going to be Mary. So what they did, they invited William III of Orange from the Netherlands, he was a Dutch guy, to invade England. And they told him, don't worry, you will come with your warships and we will just surrender. We will not give a lot of resistance. And it happened exactly like that. In 1688, Prince William III of Orange came and he conquered England. So what they did then, the parliament, because they had like this list of all the problems that they experienced with previous kings. And basically what they did, they found solutions for all those problems and those resolutions that became the bill of rights that William the third of orange and Mary had to sign before the parliament would declare them king and queen of England. So it's amazing. And then the bill of rights, of course, it was an excellent document because it separated the, the powers of government and we still rely on that today and let me just read to you some of the things that happened then it did away with excessive bail and cruel punishments it limited the powers of the king or the queen it allowed debate in parliament we know how important debate in parliament is if it wasn't for this thing that happened in our history it wouldn't have been possible for us to debate things in parliament it created the separation of powers and no royal person was allowed to interview Vin with the law any longer only civil courts because remember before that, churches also had courts. And you can just think for yourself how many people has been burned at stake by the Catholic courts. So it was an excellent thing that the courts, the, the, the church, were not allowed to have like courts anymore. It was the motivation for public elections, the fact that you and me, that we can democratically elect people to represent us in the House of Representatives. People, what a privilege, but it's all spreading from this. It allowed freedom of speech. 
It allowed people to have firearms to protect themselves for self-defense. Heaps of freedoms spread from the Bill of Rights. And it's so wonderful that we can live after that era. And then, of course, we had like the Act of Settlement Act in 1701, basically that just confirmed that no Catholic, uh, Catholic person will be the King of England anymore, the King or Queen of England anymore. In the meantime, what happened here in New Zealand of course, there was the Declaration of Independence and in 80, 1835. James Busby played a role there, but it was when the, it was done by the United Tribes of New Zealand, the Maori people, whom we dearly need and dearly love. And then, of course, there was like the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840 by Lieutenant Governor William, William Hobson. According to me, this is the most important constitutional document and the very first one that we have in Aotearoa. Unfortunately, there were and there still is Differences because when the people signed the Treaty of Waitangi, there were words like Kawanatanga that the Maori people see as governance and the English Pakia people see it as sovereignty. So even though the people signed like a treaty, remember it's a treaty, it's not a contract. There wasn't consensus at Eden. In other words, they had different ideas or opinions in mind when that document was signed. And because of that, there was a lot of conflict about the document. And then the New Zealand Maori Council versus Attorney General in that important court case in 1987. The appeal court decided that the Treaty of Waitangi is not forming part of the New Zealand law at all. Unless, unless, because there's certain portions that has been adopted by the legislator. In other words, if certain portions are adopted in legislation, yes then it is part of the New Zealand law. And we all know that the, the Treaty of Waitangi Tribunal, at this very moment, they use the Treaty of Waitangi and we are, they are still working on it. And eventually, I believe, there will be total consensus between all the different groups of this lovely rainbow nation here in New Zealand. And I believe everybody will agree about what was said and there will be harmony because I believe this country, I mean, we are only 5 million people in New Zealand and yeah, it's a small amount of people and it's a big country and I believe there's space enough for all of us.